side of the line. A member of the 57th Pennsylvania. The fight for a while was all in our favor. And we drove the enemy back across the field. But just before entering the open field around the widow Tapp's house, we could see the Confederates in great confusion, but owing to the density of the woods through which we had been chasing the enemy, our lines had become disordered. And before that could be rectified, everything was going to change. General Alexander Webb of the Union Army, Second Corps. The fact is that the whole of the left was disorganized. And from General Hancock, the Corps commander, down through David Bell Burney and John Gibbon, division commanders, each general commanded something not strictly in his command. So, as we look at the troops in front of us, we are looking at the Union Fifth Corps, we are looking at the Union Sixth Corps, we are looking at the Union Second Corps, and all of them have become one great mass. For the men themselves, this has been a still a furious experience. Any combat is. Even routing the Confederates, this has been a harrowing moment. We get that sense from a couple of the soldiers. Remember the second U.S. sharpshooter. May 6th finds me at an early hour engaging the enemy in deadly contact. William B. Green wrote, This is my first battle. And when I started on the charge this morning, I felt that I could do anything for my bleeding country. But after I got out of that first time, my patriotism died. And I thought of nothing but to keep clear of the enemy's bullets. So this is a dangerous place. And the danger is the guns in front of you. A member of the 20th Indiana, a man named Thomas B. or W. Stevens, was nearly killed by these guns, but he was protected by providence. Because in fact, the strike in his chest would be deflected. Stevens wrote in his diary, a little after daylight we went into battle and charged on the rebel works and took scores of prisoners. And I was hit in the coming back. Somebody will stand, somebody will fight, anybody is important at this point. It's a small, diminutive group of only 811 men against 20,000 Federals in front of them. But Robert E. Lee will ride back to see them. Perhaps McGowan has rallied after all. Maybe he would make good on his claim that they would fight as well as ever. But as he rode back to this group, he did not recognize the commander at their head, a Brigadier General that was unfamiliar to him. A brigadier general named John Gray, a man who came from the West and was making his debut here in the East for the first time. Since Lee did not recognize this man, he asked, what troops are these? To which he was answered in a chorus, we are Texas troops. And Robert E. Lee became incredibly emotional. He took off his head and started to wave it around his head and said, hurrah for Texas! Texas always drives them. He's enthusiastic and excited because this is perhaps one of the best answers he could receive at this moment of crisis. Not that Texans in and of themselves will be any different than any of the other shock troops. So, in fact, maybe they won't. But at this particular moment, the most critical element that we have to win is that there are only one group of Texans in Lee's entire army. And that group of Texans are in James Longstreet's corps. So if we have Texans in the field at Widow Tax, Longstreet has arrived. Reinforcements are at hand. And that's what we need. Now that's one moment. That's one thing to think about. But it's only 811 men. They need to buy time for the rest of those troops to deploy and join us on this field. The Texans in truth weren't so animated or excited as he was at this particular moment. One of the
soldiers noted that the general quickly ran up to General Gregg and quickly talked to him. In that quickness, he not only discovered that they were Texans, he also saw General Longstreet for the first time. Longstreet gave orders to the Texans saying, press forward into the field itself. Robert E. Lee, at that point, also gave further instruction, saying that you need to clear them out of the woods, that they will stay there and fire at you all day long, and we cannot accept that. Let the men know that I will observe them as they go forward. And with that, General Gregg is going to draw the Texas Brigade to attention and let them know what they're supposed to do. With the admonition, the eyes of General Lee will be upon you. And they advance from behind you towards this line of artillery. Fire! Fire to the The field of smoke would have obscured everything in front of them. And they would enter into that haze and enter into a battle, a battle for their very life. 811 men are going to go forward from this place into that field to meet thousands of Union soldiers that they have yet to see in a field that has been obscured by 12 tents that have given up almost 20, 10 times the amount of smoke that you're dealing with right now. You have to smell a battle about you right now. You are smelling what Texans smell as they prepare to go into this field and as they start to march forward there is nothing ahead of them except the enemy. As they move forward, General Longstreet is quickly trying to get other troops rallied. He's trying to move forward. He too is challenging the third four men as they head to the rear, saying, What is this? Is this the Army of Northern Virginia? We've never seen them run. Right. 